Welcome to Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down with NACAM Saskatchewan Mayor Roger Hayward. But before we dive into our interview, a brief moment to remind everyone that our newest show, Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown, airs every Monday at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time on YouTube or by searching Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown on Spotify. Tune in as we dive into the stories that are making the municipal headlines across Canada and around the world. Now, on to the show. First off, Mayor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This is greatly appreciated. I want to start with the basic question that I start all my interviews off, and you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Roger? Oh, that's a, <laughs> a tough question. But, you know, I think it it goes back, uh, you know, my dad, he served on the school board and different things when when I was growing up and when we moved to Nakam, uh, when I when the opportunity presented itself, I had another councillor come and see me to see if I would run for a, in a by-election. And I thought, you know, that's that's something I can probably do. And I'd only been in Nakam a short time, but uh, I thought, well, it's a good way to to get into the community and and just be a part of it. And and I think that's uh, I think that's me what we're lacking. Uh, you know, right now in 2023, to a, a big extent, is people not wanting to get involved. But I thought it was a great way to get out, to uh, meet the meet the people that I haven't met, and try and put put something back into the community. So I, I want I want to dive into what you just said there in a few minutes, but I want to stick on who you are and get to the crux of who Roger is. Did you always, did you ever think you'd ever be a politician? Was that ever something that was on your mind to be, I'm going to be mayor of a town one day, or I'm going to be an MLA, or I'm going to be an MP, or were you just comfortable being sort of the person that was helping out in the community and just elected politics kind of just came because someone asked? It, that's pretty much <laughs> what it was. It, somebody asked and, you know, okay, well, it sounded interesting. <laughs> I, you know, I like that type of thing. And and I've always been in in sales and and that type of thing, so it, it's kind of a natural thing. You you want to meet people and talk to people and learn the stories and and be involved in in the community. So no, I'd never aspired to be a politician. It just kind of I grew into it, I guess. But uh, but municipal politics is is where where I draw the line. So that's uh, I think that's where where it'll end up anyway. What was the draw to municipal politics? Because you you kept on coming back to it. You 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 don't uh, you don't continue to put let your name stand if you don't enjoy it, but you also don't let your name continue to stand unless you don't feel like you have something to contribute to your community. What was the desire to continuously put your name forward? Because uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you've been on if I'm not mistaken five terms now. Uh, well, partway in there, there were three year terms, then they turned to four. So it's hard <laughs> to talk in terms of, of terms, but, uh, I got on council in 1996. So, uh, yeah, I've been, been involved in, you know, for a long time and in our town and, and on council. And, uh, I think it's just a, it's a great way to promote your town and work with your town and try and make it the best you can, you can make it, you know, we're, you know, my first son was born in 1996, so it's, I think all of us on council, no matter where we are, you you want to make your community a, a better place for your kids and grandkids, and and that's kind of just how it stayed, and it, it's been a progression, you know, through that, getting involved in SUMA and, and provincially and federally, but um, I think you know the the crux of the matter is you you do it for your own community to make it the best it can possibly be you have probably seen some changes over the time that you've been elected to municipal council with the changes of provincial governments the changes of federal governments what's been the biggest change municipalities have had to address over the last 
10, 15, 20 years that you've been on council. And what do you see the future of municipalities being like as we head into sort of this unknown economic turmoil that we're in right now nationally? Right. It that that could be a loaded question, but <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it's we all struggle right from the time I got on council till today is your infrastructure, making sure you've got you're meeting the basic needs of, of your population. And of course, you want to try and grow your business base and you know, make sure you have the things that attract people to your community. And and that's getting harder and harder in communities our size as well. You know, we're only 650 people and so you're you're competing with the larger centers around you but you also offer things that those larger communities can't offer and so i think you have to you know make sure you grow that as much as you can and all the while keeping your basic needs you know your grocery store your banking institutions whatever medical uh, you can provide, that's getting harder and harder as well. But, you know, your basic services, fire, ambulance, that type of thing. Um, and it, it, it's hard, you know, the infrastructure is, is, uh, is huge and it's so, so expensive. Uh, you know, is right it an now, uphill battle trying to address the infrastructure needs of communities, especially in even NICAM? Because uh, I, I have talked to people from SUMA, I've talked to uh, municipality organizations across Canada, and infrastructure seems to be a reoccurring theme that goes on and on. And it's oh. not something that's just popped over up over the last year. It's been going on for some time. How do how 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 do you see yourself in your role as mayor and even as councillor and even as uh, past president of SUMA in trying to help address the infrastructure deficit that municipalities we're facing and are facing today it's it i i honestly don't think it's ever going to end we will we will never catch up <laughs> and that's uh i love you know, i love I honesty roger <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know i i don't want to be negative but in all honesty we we can't catch up um you know the the money just isn't there to do all your projects in one year the there isn't enough people to do the work all in one year or even in five years so you have to spread everything out to make your payments manageable uh from your tax base because you can't all you know we see what what's going on in in the city of saskatoon the the battle they're having trying to find a way to to balance what they need to do it's no different in a small town we just deal with different zero you know fewer zeros but, you know, you can't put the burden on your taxpayer all in five years. And, you know, we're looking at a, at a, a sewer lift station replacement and sewer line upgrading. And, you know, that, that's $1.5 million for a community of 680. And that's just your sewer system. We've got a water plant that's going to need replacing over the, in sometime in the next, well, it should be done within seven years but it's probably going to be 10 years out so you you try and maintain what you've got well those repairs are getting costly every year and the people that do that type of work there's not many around so it, it's even a struggle to get companies to tender on your projects in a smaller community because their costs are higher to come out here so that just flows downhill so your costs end up being higher so it you know, the, the infrastructure deficit, I, I don't think will ever be addressed fully. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing project that we'll all have to just keep managing and keep doing to the best of our ability. You have been on council for some of the, some of the biggest downloads that we have seen probably over the last 10, 15 years. And municipalities are being asked to do more with less money right now, or even with the same amount of money, just more things added onto their list. Um, right. Is it sustainable? Is it sustainable for even smaller communities like NICAM, like compared to Saskatoon, your budget, like you said, probably has a few less zeros than what Saskatoon is dealing with. But yeah. you still have the issues that de they're dealing with. It may not be as prominent as a homeless issue, but you're, I'm assuming you're dealing with a housing crisis. You're dealing with probably some crime issues. Is it hard to be a municipality in 2023 when people are asking you to do more with less? 
Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, uh, in my time on council, it had the last couple of years, you know, I hate to keep bringing COVID up, but you know, that was, that was all part of it too. And, and it, it is a huge, huge struggle. And, you know, sustainability is, is an interesting, interesting word because it means different things to different communities. You know, nobody wants to admit, you know, we're done. We can't do it anymore because in actuality, we, we have to, we have to find a way um, that, that is manageable and cost effective. And, you know, yeah, our roads may not be perfect. In fact, they're far from perfect. I'll be first to admit that, but we have safe drinking water. We have, uh, you know, a, a good sewer system and it's going to be better. Uh, we've got uh, an excellent volunteer fire department. We've got our own ambulance. We're, we're meeting the basic needs in NACOM, but, and we're gonna continue to do that, but we need the other two levels of government to recognize what we are doing and what, how we're facing that. And that is, that is a big struggle. Um, I mentioned it in a, in a speech when I received uh, an award at SUMA this last year that, and I firmly believe it, municipal government is the absolute most important level of government we have because we deal with the uh, downloading, the issues, we deal with that first and foremost every day. You know, when you're provincial government and federal government, they don't see the effects of the regulations they bring in. Not, not even the slightest hint of, of seeing what uh, their decision costs us at the end of the day or the effect it has on, on the people in the street. So we deal with it every day and it's, it's, it's very difficult. And that's why I think we're seeing it, how difficult it is to get people on council anymore as well. Okay, I, I, we are not even 10 minutes into this conversation. I'm already loving it because you have just brought up something that I think is the most important thing that probably is facing municipalities. You are right. It is the most important level of government is municipalities. It is the one that people deal with the most on a regular basis. But, and I caveat this by saying people don't care about municipal politics they don't and i and, and i'm not being i'm not trying to be rude there roger i'm just yeah. being truth yeah. most people i just drove across canada and when i was stopping in municipalities smaller municipalities i would ask the question who your mayor is and the majority of people would not know and they did not know they knew who their mp or their mla was but they couldn't tell me who their local councillor was because in in their mind as long as their water is turned on and their garbage is picked up, or if their garbage is taken away, they're happy. How okay. do you change the apathy that comes along with municipal government in 2023 and make municipalities kind of the most important and the one that people should be paying attention to? Because the decisions you make at a council meeting on Tuesday are implemented Wednesday morning. <laughs> Absolutely. And and you know, I I don't think uh, we toot our own horn as much as we need to. Now you can it can also be said that you know if if people don't know who their mayors and councillors are, but yet their you know their water is running every day and their sewer is going away every day and their garbage is picked up, well I guess we're doing something right. You know, uh, it's like in a in a hockey game. The best hockey game is when you don't even know the that the ref is there. You know, it, you play hockey, it just goes on. And that's what that's what our job is, is to make sure all those things happen. But we, we need to and we must make sure people know what the cost is and what we're doing and what we're up against to make that happen every day. And that's why I, I got involved with Suma as much as I did. We needed to bring that story and and that to the provincial government and you know by being involved in SUMA you're involved in FCM as well so you you bring that to the federal government which is you know a whole other tougher matter but um it's it's a struggle to bring that to the provincial government and I get it we only have one taxpayer but they have to realize what we are up against every day to to make this happen without municipal governments it doesn't matter what Regina or Ottawa do 
if we don't implement it, it doesn't matter what they do. We're the ones that have to do all of their labor. And I, and I don't even think to a point that they understand that. And maybe they don't understand the role of, of municipal government where they keep saying we're, we're only uh, there because of the provincial government. But in my view, we are, we are the level of government that, that deals with everything. So besides tooting your own horn, how do you get people engaged in municipal politics? We are seeing a big uh, portion of this country and a lot of municipalities, and I would say even Suma, uh, Saskatchewan, sorry, where municipalities are just not going contested when there comes elections. There's a lot of acclamations going on across Canada in the municipal realm because people just don't think it's a level of government that they see themselves giving back at. They'd rather give back provincially or federally or not even give back in the political realm at all. How do we get people involved in municipal politics and get them to put their name on the ballot besides asking them, which mm -hmm. I, that's what someone did for you to get you involved? What are the ways that we can attract the right people? And I say right people because everyone's going to say, well, what, what's a wrong person? Well, I don't know. I'm just saying that there's right people and there's wrong people for municipal government. And how do we attract the, the right people to put their names on the ballot? Honestly, right now, I don't know. Uh, I've seen the change, you know, where social media has come in. And I think that alone has scared a lot of people from putting their name into the public view. You know, it's, it's, it's no different than federally and provincially, uh, municipal wise. Why would you put yourself out there to be hated upon on Twitter and Facebook every time you say one word that one person doesn't like. You know, so the the haters, I I don't like saying that, but that's what it is it, on social media, I think are making it so the, the good people that want to do uh, good things for their community or province or country, it's making it very tough for them to want to put them and their family in front of everything like that. You know, you, you say, well, taxes got to go up. Even if you say they got to go up 1%, well, immediately you've got haters on Facebook and Twitter saying you can't do that. But then in reality, you ask them, well, how much did your gas bill go up this month? It's no different from us on the municipality. Our costs increase too. And a lot of people don't understand that. They just, you know, they just think that a, a two or a four or 6% increase in their taxes, which in, in our town may only be under $100 a year increase. Well, look at what your gas and power and, and gasoline costs have, have done. And I realize that it's another increase, but you know, we're dealing with those same things. Our parts for our water plant go up, our parts for our lawnmowers go up, you know, so it, it, you're putting yourself out there and people just, and it's immediate, you know, it, it used to be you had to wait a week for the newspaper, the, even the next day for the newspaper. Now it's, it's absolutely immediate. So why would, you know, good candidates or people that want to do it for the right reasons, not just the paycheck, you know, municipally, you don't do it for the paycheck, of course. But... What? You don't get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars being a mayor of a small town? That's no, what they and, and tell me what on social people, media. But, yeah, oh, I know. And and so, yeah, but we are seeing people that, that are running just for the pay. You know, it, it, it does pay well provincially, federally. But that's not the right reason to be there. You want to be there to make change, to improve things. And, you know, if, if you've got a person with a good job making, say, $100,000 a year, why would he take a job for a little bit more and, and be ridiculed and, and hated upon every single day? And then it's not just them, it's their families are brought into it. it at the end of the day, I see why some, you know, some people are saying, I'm never getting involved because of that. And that's, I think that's one of the biggest drawbacks right now 
And, and you're right, we're seeing a lot of acclamations. And, and honestly, I've been mayor since 2000. I've never been elected. I've always been acclaimed. Do you think and, that hurts democracy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, don't get me wrong. You're probably happy because you don't have to run an election. You don't have to put up <laughs> signs, but you'd probably want to get out there from time to time and actually go knock on some doors and see what the pulse of the community is like, wouldn't you? Absolutely. You need to know what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. And and the apathy is just, it, it's amazing, you know, and we're seeing it, you know, provincially they're, they're getting their uh, MLAs uh, nominated in the nomination meetings and that. And there's there's a few people, you know, running against some of the incumbents, which is is great. I think you know that's that's what democracy is built on, and uh, it, it's it does. I feel it does hurt democracy to a point where you know there's so many acclamations. It it's not a good way to have it, you know. It, I'd like to think I'm doing that good a job that nobody wants to run against me, but I, I'm not that blind. I know that that's not the case, but nobody else wants to do it either. And I, I feel, you know, somebody has to do the job. So you just keep doing it. The word respect comes uh, comes up a lot in my conversations with municipal councillors from across Canada. The respect of fellow councillors, the respect of the mayor, the respect of the taxpayer, the respect of the residents, the respect of lo other levels of government. How much respect do you put on how – I'm going to rephrase this question actually – what what role does respect come into play at the municipal level for you? And how do you see yourself in addressing respectfully the people who may disagree with you, the quote unquote haters on social media? Because while they may hate the decisions that you've put into place, you have to respect them as the taxpayer that their voices have the right to be heard. Do you not? Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and we pay very close attention to that, you know, when we get letters to the council and, you know, everything else complaining, we definitely, we take the time to look into it. Um, but I also see so many times that there is no respect. It, they'll, you know, they create fake accounts and they just blast whatever level of government they're mad at that hour and they, they don't put their name to it. Um, you know, quite a few years ago, we we decided on council we we're getting a lot of complaint letters and nobody would sign them. Well, it's tough to address a complaint when you don't know the whole story or who's complaining. So we said, no problem. You want to complain? We've got a complaint form. You sign it. It'll be addressed at council, you know, and surprisingly, the amount of complaints went down because they don't want to put their name to it. Well, that's lacking a little respect on on their side as well, and uh, so. It, but it it does play a huge part. And you know, my time at Sumi, you, you hear about different councils and and how some of their meetings went with, you know, the councillors and mayor not respecting each other. And and that you can you cannot run a council that way. You simply can't. And. And by that token, I, I feel you shouldn't be running for council if your only uh, thought to why you're running is because there's a pothole in front of my house that's been there for five years, and my sole job is I want that filled, and that's the only thing I'm worried about. That's the wrong reason to get on council, because they're not looking at the entire community. And that's what a lot of people don't understand is, or they maybe understand it, but they don't care about it they've got their they're worried about their house and their little world on their property and they don't realize that as councillors and mayors we have to look at the entire community yes it'd be nice to pave your street i would love to do that but there in reality there's only three cars a day going down your street where we've got another street that has 200 going down you know so you have to prioritize and people, a lot of people don't understand that. And so it, you it, have to respectfully listen to them though, right? Because they, they have the right to, yeah. and I say bitch and complain as much as the next person, pardon my French for anyone who's listening. I apologize for that word, but yeah. you have to listen to them because yeah. they have the right to address, want those issues addressed. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are literally almost a year away from the next municipal elections in Saskatchewan. Uh, from what I from what I understand, if I'm not mistaken, they're in October, beginning of November, right. 2024. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what should prospective candidates be doing right now, like right here, right now in 2023, if they're interested or even like? on the fence about putting their name forward what should what, what should a prospective candidate for mayor or councillor in NICAM or uh NACAM sorry or even across uh, Saskatchewan be doing at this moment to sort of figure out if they would be a good fit for municipal politics i think first thing is go to a council meeting Shockingly, I'd be surprised if a lot of people I've talked to actually went to a council meeting before they actually got elected. Oh, I know. But you know, that's the simplest way. One, it, it shows you the process because a lot of people don't understand, you know, the process of a counseling that there's there's rules that you must follow and legislation you must follow. And so you go to a council meeting, you'll start to learn that. You'll learn how decisions are arrived at. And you'll see if if that's you know up your alley to do uh next reach out to a mayor or counselor you know some mayors and counselors may not want to talk to you about running against them but i think in a in the a vast majority of of small urban municipalities that wouldn't be a problem at all you have a question about council and how it operates phone one of the counselors or or the mayor or stop in a town office, talk to the administrator. They're an absolute wealth of information that uh, you can learn a lot from talking to them. And so, you know, it's as simple as do a little bit of background, do a little homework to see if, if it's what you want to do. And I would encourage a lot of people to do that because we're, we, we have to have councils. And if, uh, if it, if you don't elect a council, well, then the government steps in. You don't want that. <laughs> you do not want that to happen. The, the, the provincial government doesn't want to do that. So, you know, elect your, you know, the people in your town. And, uh, but when you're running, you have to realize that it's for the entire community, not your little project or your, your, your one thing that you want changed. You have to look at it more broadly. You think that, and I, I, and I, I'm going to paint a broad stroke here. And I apologize to anyone in my generation who's listening to this and is about to yell at their computer screen or yell at their car radio if they're listening to this driving on the highway. Um, my generation uh, wouldn't really like, and I'm kind of a unique oddity. I follow municipal politics. I enjoy municipal politics. I worked in municipal politics. I know the difference between what a counselor can do and can't do. They are there to direct policy and set the direction. Administration is there to actually implement it and actually do the things. There's a lot of people in my generation and even the younger generations who think they can get elected and just sort of direct where the grader should go and what the uh, water plant operates should be doing to make sure that the water is going to the the correct houses. Um, do you find that most people who are getting elected today, and I'm painting a broad stroke here, sort of want to be in the administration of the policy instead of, instead of setting the policy that they're actually supposed to do as the municipal councillor? I think that's uh, that's <laughs> a big part of it. Yeah, you know, it, you know, your grader wasn't out. 20 minutes after the last snowflake fell in a blizzard and three years ago, and I'm going to change that. And I'm going to tell the foreman what to do. And, and, you know, we work in a small community, you work very close with your, your employees, but at the end of the day, we have one employee, our CAO, you know, okay, this, I had a complaint, this street needs graded or, or whatever you talk to your CAO, they'll, do a work order, have the, the foreman go check it out. Or, you know, we do talk to our foreman as well and say, hey, if this fits, you know, we're not telling you what to do. If you got time, check it out. You know, that type of thing. 
but essentially well there's the heavy hand and then there's the suggestions right and yeah, I, and i completely I, agree with that i've worked i've met with mayors and i've worked with mayors who have been very ha heavy handed we want you out by eight o'clock and doing this street this street and this street and if you don't do this street and this street this street then you better make sure you do it and then i've yeah. worked with mayors who go okay as long as the northeast is done the quadrant which is in our bylaws and procedures i'm okay with that so yeah. it, there's a ba delicate balance there yeah absolutely and and you know when you get councils that are doing the heavy-handed approach you know bypassing their administrator and going directly to the employees those are also the ones that are having trouble getting administrators and caos because it's it makes their job uh, extremely difficult to do because all of a sudden they'll start getting questions from the foreman. Well, so on, this, this counselor told me to do this, but you told me to do something else. So you, that's why you have that streamlined approach where we we set the policy, your CAO carries it out, and that includes dealing with the employees. I want to talk about the role of council and CAO for a second because you brought it up and I want to just get your sort of 10 cents on this before we turn to the next subject. And I want to know, um, you uh, you talk about the the CAO being the only employee of the council, which is true. Right. Um, how important is it to have a, a good working relationship with that CAO? And what are the things that councils particularly as they're about to head into a new term, they're about to get elected next year, uh, looking at their CAO, what would the advice be for an incoming mayor or incoming counselor to start looking at and talking to their CAO about what the next four years look like or what, what should councils be looking for in a good CAO for those who don't have a CAO right now? Oh, there's a lot of questions in that question. So I know I, I'm, yeah. the, I'm the king of asking 12 questions and really only asking one, but try to figure out how to ask it. Yeah, it well, it is so, so do you, important. Do you know what a good CAO makes? Like how, in your opinion, what does a good CAO mean to a council? It, it means absolutely everything because they deal with every day-to-day -day item. If a mayor and council wanted to deal with all of the administrative issues, they should become <laughs> an, an administrator, but then they'd have to step down from council. So having that relationship and having a good qualified CAO is, is so important uh, because they know what the vision of council has been by the, the bylaws and policies that have been passed and the the uh, grants that have been applied for and, and the projects that are have been approved and are upcoming, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but in three years, we're going to do this project. Well, a lot of times if you change council and it can happen where you change the entire council and mayor, there is no history there. Yeah. The history rests with your CAO. So if you've, and and it has happened where the council decided, well, you told me to get my own cup of coffee last meeting, you're fired. Well, you lose everything. You lose the history. You lose the relationship with your outside employees. You, and you start from scratch. And, you know, we've, you know, we've gone through hiring a new administrator and, and it's, it's a difficult process because you have to find the right person and, you know, that, you have to figure out if their knowledge base is is correct and what they need work on and and it's it's a struggle but your CAO is is your I'll call it a lifeline for council because you know they know the legislation they you know I'm fortunate I've been in the game long enough and you know I've read the legislation I was actually on the the committee that designed the new municipal act <laughs> many many years ago so i'm fortunate that that i can even help with that to a, a certain point but okay uh, so I, I i need to clarify something here so you you were on the committee that wrote the uh, the new mga the municipal government act for saskatchewan was that when you introduced that caos and ceos had to have schooling to do their job and 
if with like if they had to have some a type of uh, education to be a CAO, uh, municipal government experience through the University of Saskatchewan, University of Regina, or any uh, registered university or college. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure when that was written into the legislation. Cause, and I'm and now you're going to test me on <laughs> on the years because I was on we it was called the Town and Village Leg Legislative Review Committee. And that would have been in about 19, it was actually before I got on, no, okay. right as soon as I got on council. So it, it would have been in that 96 time frame. Okay, so it was before you. Okay, I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think some of that was in there. Some of it's been changed now. You know, the wording where now the CAO is recognized as, as council's only employee. So that was streamlined a little bit, but that was working with, with the administrators association as well. So, um, okay. so that's where it did come from, but I think the education portion was before that. Uh, okay. Because, yeah. Um, and no, it, I, I appreciate your honesty there because I, I just, I've wanted to ask why that was brought in because it just seems uh, because it's, uh, from what I can see, uh, gather, Saskatchewan is the only province that requires sort of some type of education for their CAOs. And I just wanted to know, uh, right. like get to the bottom of why that is, but uh, yeah. I, I've gotten some answers, but nothing officially on the record. So I'll, I'll just <laughs> move on from this statement, <laughs> this question. I, I, I want to talk about one last thing. And then I said one last thing in the last question, but I just thought of this question. And that's the great thing about my show. I can ask as many questions as I want in the time allotted. Absolutely. Um, the personal life of a counselor slash mayor, a local counselor is always on display. You go to the grocery store, you are a mayor, you are a counselor. You go to the park with your family, you are a mayor or counselor. You go to the restaurants, you're a mayor or counselor. That means residents will come up to you from time to time even when you're out with family and ask you questions about what's going on in the city or town or village. Um, a lot of municipal councillors and mayors that I speak to say the job is what you make it. The job is as much as you put into it. So if you put in 10 hours a week just for meetings, that's what the job is. There are some councillors and mayors who want to be a full-time council and mayor with less pay. Do you see the role of municipal councillor, uh, municipal politicians changing even more over the next 10 years where that that sort of uh, gray area between who Roger is on his spare time and who Roger is as mayor are no longer going to be Roger person, Roger mayor, but actually just you're going to be mayor 24 seven, no matter where you go. And you're just going to have to get used to it. I I actually think we're there now. Okay. Um, and and some of that is like I touched on before the social media. You know, if I if I post something for work or from my, you know, my full-time job, people can construe that to meaning something from being mayor. You know, so the the lines are very very blurred already. So I I don't think that there is a separation anymore uh you know and, and it used to be you know in in the 70s and 80s yeah you go to your meeting once a month or once every two weeks and you were there for two hours had a bit had a coffee a bit of a visit and passed a couple of bylaws and go home uh those days are are gone you know it's uh we're not full-time mayors and council in nakem but um i think probably does Most it weigh on does it weigh on you for someone who has your experience as a municipal politician you've got to be able to have found a sort of a, a a smooth spot a sort of a a delicate balance where you can be just Roger with your family and then mayor when you're out in the public or even out when you're out grocery shopping or because of the way that the society is and everyone wants everything as like right at their fingertips and right when they want it, um, right. you sort of can't find that balance anymore. And you've just come to realize that you're now Mayor Hayward 24 <laughs> seven. <laughs> well, and I think anybody that runs for council and mayor now kind of understands that to a point. It It does change how you, how you view things and how you're viewed in the public eye. So, you, you know, you have to be mindful of that. 
Um, and yeah, I've done it long enough. It it doesn't bother me uh, anymore. You know, made, and I'm not sure if it actually ever did, you know, because that's the, just the type I am. But, um, you know, it, but it, it is, it does weigh on some people. Absolutely. You know, I've heard it from many councillors and mayors that had SUMA conventions over the last how many years that, you know, geez, I, I can't even, I can't even go downtown to have a cup of coffee, you know, and, and they're right, you know, uh, I don't go to Coffee Row anymore, uh, but I never did a lot, but you, you kind of got tired of all the offhand comments and that, but I also let it kind of roll off as well. And, and, you know, my great comeback, and I think we've all used it, you know, if you're going to complain that much, I've got nomination papers at the office. I can come back and, and I'll sign your nomination paper. You can run and, you know, throw your hat in the ring and see, see how easy it is. And a lot of times that ends the conversation, but um, <laughs> It, so it, it, but it does, I could see where it weighs on, on some people, maybe not so much in, in a community our size, but, you know, in say city of Saskatoon, PA Regina, where you're essentially a full-time counselor, maybe not, you know, classified as that, but, you know, you're dealing with several hundred thousand residents. It's a full-time job, more than a full-time job. And for new people to get involved in that, in that, 25 to 30 year old range that's a lot of responsibility on them especially when they're trying you know they're just starting out raising a family it it's a big weight for them to to carry but those are also the people we need to get involved and that is i can't say that enough that that age group we have to have them involved and we're not seeing it and we have to change that somehow and i don't have the answer on how we're going to change it but we need to get those people involved. They're the they're the up and comers with the the new ideas, the young families. They know what they need for the next 20 years. And those are the people we need involved. I I will say this, and this is my opinion, not the mayor's, but I'm gonna say that for those who are interested in provincial and federal politics, take a look municipally first. Run municipal. Get your sort of uh, feet wet and then take a step into the provincial realm because the experience you get pr uh, municipally will set you apart from any other politician. And that's my opinion, federally or provincially. There's that statement. I yeah. want to turn to your role as mayor now, and I want to talk about the town for a few seconds here before I let you go, because I just realized we're at 40 minutes and I haven't gotten to the second segment of the conversation yet. <laughs> so I want to ask this, and I want to preface the question by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a direction of council. This is not a motion of council. This is his opinion. Uh, mayor, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing your community today? Our infrastructure. We talked about it before. Yeah. Um, uh, that is that's going to be probably number one, um, and making sure we keep the services we have now that we keep them for the foreseeable future. And it's it's a tough job, but that those are two things that we have to make sure we have. You know, we've got a K to twelve school. We've we've got a lot of business in town. We have to try and expand that if possible. It's very tough because it's so easy to drive to Saskatoon now. Um, but we need to make sure and, and try and work with our businesses to, to change and, and refocus to, you know, what do they need? And we try and do that. But um, those, are, those are some big things. And infrastructure, like we've said before, it, it's a huge deficit, but we have to keep working on it. And we have to be able to, to keep that up because the minute you don't have good water, good sewer, fire department, uh, police services were already struggling there. But when you start losing that, you start losing people. You um, 
there's a financial reality that we have to talk about here for a second because municipalities don't have an endless supply of money as much as most most people think they may. Um, you talk about the infrastructure that the municipality needs, the town needs to continue to operate. You need to continuously upgrade sewer, water, roads, sidewalks, parks, playgrounds, this, that, and the other. And then on top of that, you have the individual needs that your residents will ask you for. I need this pothole fix. I believe that we should have a pool. I believe we should have a skate park. How do you balance what the community wants with what the direction of council believes is the right thing to do? You have to do a really good job of communication. And, and I'm not saying we do a great job. We need to improve ourselves uh, right now. Uh, but we need to let the community know, uh, you know, our, our rink. We lose $100,000 a year, give or take, on operating our rink. Well, this is, you know, but everybody wants a rink and we need it. So we have to do it. But this is, this is why maybe we're not fixing those 10 potholes. Our money is tied up here. And just be open and transparent with with your residents, and you know, get them to understand what what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I think a lot of councils operate in in almost a vacuum. They you know, well, we know what we're doing. We're going to do this, and you know, they don't get that information out. We try and do an information uh, pamphlet with our water bills that go out every three months. You know, this is what we're doing. This is why. You know, when we do budget, we include that with our the next water bill after we pass our budget. This is what we're doing. This is the money we've got. This is where the money is going. And, you know, you, you just, we need to improve communication. I think all councils need to do that. We, sometimes we think we're doing a good job, but I don't think we are. We need to improve that. So, um, um, communications is key. And I, I love the fact that you brought that up because it's one of the, my biggest things that as a former communications person for a municipality, I, I know this, but there's a caveat to communications. Councils and municipalities can communicate till they're blue in the face. They can go door knock. They can go mail and you're laughing, but you know where this question's going. How do you communicate with a population that sometimes doesn't want to be communicated to? Because you can put things on the radio, the website, the Facebook page, the uh, like mailers and the utility bills, the emails out, the email blast. You can do as much as you want. There's always going to be people who say, I didn't get it. I didn't know about this. I didn't know that this was happening. I didn't realize that there was a no public open house. So how do you see the role of council and your town and yourself as mayor in trying to make sure that everyone is communicating, communicate it with, but understanding that you only can go 90% of the way. Some people have to finish that 10%. Yeah. Uh, I don't have an answer for you on that. <laughs> because, and I, I think you know as well, you you can't make people read everything they get. Yeah. You know, but, but also, you know, I, I kind of put down the social media, but this is where nowadays the information is there and it's there at your fingertips in seconds everybody has their phone glued to their hand you can find out 99.9 percent .9 of what you need to know probably in under 30 seconds and you know we we're redoing our website right now to make it uh, more user friendly and more user friendly on mobile devices because we you know we've done some research we know that a lot of websites aren't don't work well on phones, so we're making sure ours will. So you put the you make sure you put the information out there. So when somebody says, "Well, I didn't get that," well, no, you did. It, but you also can't make them read it. Or the understanding part is another thing. We you have to put the information out there that's easy to understand. And a lot of what we do isn't easy to understand. There's there's days where I'm trying to figure out what the heck that means. But how know, many acronyms do you deal with on a regular basis as a mayor? Because that's my hardest thing to keep track of. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, that is. Yeah, that's that is a pet peeve. But some of the uh, names are so long that you can't remember them either. So, but uh, I think you know it. It is very tough. You can't make everybody. Uh, read what you've 
put out there. But in today's world, the information is there if they want to look. That's the key, if they want to look. And I want to oh, go ahead, finish no, up. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, go okay. ahead. I, I want to turn to my last uh, subject here because I am just cautious of time because I know you are a busy person and you probably want to get back to your regular job uh, besides being mayor for an hour. I, I want to talk about my favorite subject and it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart because I believe that we don't do it enough here in Canada. We don't promote enough of it here in Canada tourism. Tourism in our local communities is at an all-time low, I find. I just drove across Canada visiting small town Saskatchewan, small town Manitoba, small town Ontario, Quebec, and even Alberta. And I want to know from you, what are the tourist spots that you would hi highly recommend in your area of NACAM? Oh, we've we've got a lot, actually. Even very close to NACAM, uh, we've got our golf course. Uh, small little nine hole golf course, artificial greens, but we've got a, a group of, of young, uh, I'll say mostly guys, but you know, there's some, some ladies involved in well in it as well that came together because it, they saw it on the decline. Uh, the town, it's a struggle for us to, to do much with it. They stepped up and they've done a phenomenal job. They're doing tournaments. They're doing a, a night golf here coming up in September They've done a great job. So we've got a great golf course nearby. We've got Lake Sharon close by that another, another new group got involved there, brought it back up to where it should be. We've got Greenwater Provincial Park, 45 minutes from NACOM. You know, we pull our camper out there every summer for three weeks. And that's where we go because it's close enough to home that, you know, it, it's so nice and it's a great park. And, you know, we've got golf courses all around us. We've got great regional parks with we've got oh i should have counted but just off the top of my head we've probably got three or four regional parks within an hour drive we've got as many golf courses as you, as you want to go within an hour's drive so there's lots to do locally that doesn't cost a lot that's easy to get to um but you're right tourism is falling and uh, I don't know, I think it was even falling before COVID because we were seeing the, the costs of all that go up, you know, and, and, and now with, with what, where we are financially in our country, you know, the price of gas is, is unbelievable and getting worse. So it's I just drove across Canada. I know. <laughs> exactly. Don't try pulling a camper, you know, yeah. and doing that as well. And, you know, airfare, it, it's, it's very expensive. Um, you know, we don't have to fly in Saskatchewan. We can drive, you know, anywhere and see some great attractions all over this province, from dinosaurs to sand dunes to, you know, and have the best fishing in, in I would say, in, in the world, right in Saskatchewan. But it's hard to get there because of the costs associated. And, you know, people with young families, the, you know, they've got enough cost putting their kids back to school this fall. Yeah. You add everything on it, and they've just bought a house that their mortgage was $1,200, and now it's $2,400. And, you know, grocery, so you tie all that in. And, and I could see why tourism is probably the first thing to take a hit. And, and it's too bad because tourism dollars in our communities will go a long way to funding those infrastructure needs. And, and I will so, be the first to admit that uh, after this trip to Cross Candle that I just did, I would highly recommend everyone just take a day trip in your communities or even out to another community and explore because you'd be surprised at what you can see. I, yeah. I never thought I would see a Eiffel Tower in Saskatchewan, but here we are seeing an Eiffel Tower, seeing a big giant red paper clip in Saskatchewan. But that's the great thing about just getting off the beaten path and just exploring. And Absolutely. that's my that's my plug for tourism in Saskatchewan for two minutes. <laughs> um, Roger, I want to end on this question, and I think it's the most important question, and it's uh, it's for you as mayor of your community. What makes NACAM such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family? You know, and I've said it all along, it, it's the people in town. 
you know, we've got a great community. We've got a, a great batch of volunteers that make everything run because when council can't afford to do something, you you have to lean on your volunteers to to take on a project or a job, whether it's your museum or your food bank or you name it, you know, fire department, it, all of it. And and we've got a, a great group of people in town. And, and I, you know, some may not like me or the job I do, but at the end of the day, we've got a great group of people in town that do a lot of Really they may good. not like you, but they seem to not want to run against you. So that tells me that they do like you, Roger. Yeah, well, they're, they're going to have the opportunity because uh, this is going to be my last term. So there's somebody's going to and somebody will step up. And that's that's the beauty of, of municipal politics as well. Somebody will, you know, is out there that will do it. And and that's what we need. We need to get new people involved. So. I'm looking forward to that as well. So I guess with that sort of revelation, I kind of knew that, but I didn't want to talk about it for a second. I want to end on actually on this question because you brought it up. So I'm going to ask this last question for you. Looking back, looking back on your time as a municipal councillor, as mayor of your community, was it worth it? Was it worth the time, the energy to make your community a better place? Looking back on all the accomplishments and how far your community has grown since you first were elected in 1996 to, to where you are now? I absolutely. I I don't think I would I would change anything. Uh, you know, there there was probably some things I missed with my family and my kids, and and I think they realized that, but. Um, I, I truly believe that you have to get involved in your community as well. If, if you, it, it's part of, part of growing up and, and being a, a, a part of a community. You can't just exist in your community. I feel you have to put something back and, and you don't have to spend 26 years on council to put back, you know, you do one term or you, you volunteer at a, at a couple of barbecues. It's still, being involved and and putting yourself out there and and absolutely i wouldn't i wouldn't change a thing roger i want to thank you um our half hour interview turned into a 52 minute interview <laughs> and i'm always appreciative of, of people like yourself taking time out of their busy day to sit down and talk about truly the most important level of government which is municipal so thank you so much for serving and hopefully we'll actually be able to have an actual longer conversation in person in regina in 2024 next spring and we'll actually potentially just just go grab a coffee if you want absolutely i i do have uh, full intentions of being at that one so absolutely let's get together and do that and thank you for your time and and the interviews you've done across Canada are phenomenal. I think you've done a great job in bringing municipal governance to the forefront. And, you know, it, it, as, as pre past president of SUMA, I think it's done a really good job bringing what we do to the other levels of government. Uh, that that's a whole other interview segment I think we could talk about but oh I, I, I'm a person who looks at numbers and statistics and for some reason I'm not trying to toot my own horn here but always always the second largest uh, area that my show is listened to is the Ottawa region so I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing I'm thinking I have the ear of Justin Trudeau Pierre Polyev and Jagmeet Singh but I guarantee you they aren't Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. 
Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires both dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, stay talking.